everybody, I'm back and you know what that means, more constitution talk. Today we're going to be talking about a little thing called the Fourth Amendment. It's pretty pretty small, not a lot to it, right? But there's, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of definitions coming from Supreme Court cases. Uh, so what does the Fourth Amendment say? That's where we start. There are two clauses, the Reasonableness Clause and the Warrant Clause. The reasonableness clause straight out of the constitution says this the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated the second clause no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. The first question we need to ask is under the Fourth Amendment, when does a search occur? Okay, so there are a couple of base rules. The first one comes out of a case called Map v. Ohio. The rule that came from that case is the exclusionary rule. That means that all evidence obtained by searches and seizures in violation of the Fourth Amendment is not admissible in a state court. So if the police go into someone's house looking for drugs and they come out with illegal weapons instead. If the police had to go digging around for that and they had to search, like cut open the mattress, things like that, uh, that would be in violation of the Fourth Amendment and would not be admissible in a state court. The next thing is uh, an aspect of the Fourth Amendment that includes statements made in the public. If so something is said such as, I just killed my professor, I don't like him. And I say that to my friend Tyler, and we're in the middle of a Starbucks. Guys, that's not private. That's very, very public and uh, can be used against me. This rule is called the CATS test, and it comes from CATS v. United States. The test states two things. There are two factors that must be met. First, for a Fourth Amendment search, a person must exhibit an actual subjective. They must believe themselves that they have an expectation of privacy where they are. And two, that subjective expectation of privacy is one the public believes exists as well. So I have an expectation of privacy inside my own home, inside my own car, and everyday people would also have that expectation of privacy. I do not, however, have an expectation of privacy when I'm walking down my street or out in the store or in public somewhere. Uh, and general people would not have that expectation of privacy as well. That's how the CATS test works. The third general rule for searches and seizures occurs uh, when defining the difference between an open field and curtilage. Activities that occur in an open field are not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Police officers can fly over that area, search that area, enter that area. It doesn't matter what they do, it will not constitute a search under the Fourth Amendment. Curtilage is the area immediately adjacent, immediately next to surrounding your home, okay? And that's where intimate activities like laying on your couch, playing catch with your kid, things like that happen. That area is protected and there are four factors that go into defining curtilage or not. Proximity. So how close is the, the land around your home that you're trying to say is protected? Uh, is it enclosed with a fence? How do you use it? Do you use it for grilling out, playing catch, or kickball, or water balloon fights, whatever you do? And uh, what protective steps were taken to uh, protect that? If there's a window looking into your living room, do you have blinds that block out the view? Do you have a fence up? Do you have a uh, privacy fence up that's six feet tall and no one can see through it? It all depends on how you set up your area. I'm sure you guys have seen on the news or other places that the police use dogs for searches. When is this allowed is the question. Um, so canine searches are sui generis, its own kind. Canine searches are limited both in information obtained and the manner the drug sniffing dogs are used. So in one specific case, Illinois, the Cabalus, uh, it involves a traffic stop. All right, so during the stop, the police uh, say, all right, we're gonna use a drug sniffing dog 
to um, search your car. This is okay as long as the traffic stop is not longer than a general traffic stop would be. So if an average traffic stop is 15 minutes, then you have 15 minutes to do your check and bring in the drug sniffing dog to search the car. If it goes over that average 15 minutes, then it's an unconstitutional stop. You cannot sit there and say, hey, I'm gonna call in a canine unit and they're like 20 minutes away and you stall. And the police officer would stall you, say, no, you can't go yet, no, you can't go yet, so they can get the drug sniff dog there. That's not okay. You cannot do that. When can a drug sniffing dog, a canine police officer, uh, be used to search your home? This rule comes from the case Florida v. Jardines. The detective takes a dog up onto the porch and the dog alerts at the base of the door. Is that a search? The answer is yes. Why? Because the detective took the dog up onto the curtilage. We just talked about curtilage, right? The porch of your uh, surrounding your door, that, that area is part of your intimate personal space that cannot be searched by police officers without a warrant. Police officers they might be able to use a drug sniffing dog outside of a hotel room because is that really curtilage? Some courts say no it's not and other courts say yes it is. So that was some general information on the Fourth Amendment like when searches occur sometimes, uh, for more information, getting more in-depth into searches and seizures, check out the next video. See you later.